welcome one and all um, to our club. Um, and what we are talking about is, um, and it's really the continuation of our series, and that's the Entrepreneurial Excellence Series. Um, last time we spoke about, um, generally speaking, um, getting customers and keeping customers. How do you find customers? And then what do you do once you found them? How do you keep them? And um, as usual, you can uh, either download or listen to the playlist on Clubhouse, or you can go download or access um, the podcast on the YouTube channel um, that is Griffin Enterprise Development. All right, so uh, we look forward to our next edition in the series and um, welcome Ed, a very, very special welcome to you. And I look forward to what you have for us today. Oh, thanks, Jacques. Um, yeah, just a reminder because uh, we didn't have an event last week, um, but um, what uh, what we've been talking about is a whole series of skill sets for entrepreneurs where you might want to mark yourself on how good you are in various areas. And the area we're currently talking about is, is marketing. And we had spent a little bit of time doing the definition of marketing, which uh, of which there are about 100,000, but which I like the purpose of marketing is to get and keep customers. That's the purpose of marketing. Um, and it has many sub-dimensions around it. Uh, we gave a little hierarchy of the, the, the whole of leading from the brand right through to the sale of a hierarchy which said step number one is to tell people that you exist. Step number two is to tell people what you do and why they should be interested if they're in your target market. And step number three is to tell them why you're special. Why do you deserve their attention, let alone their money? And the fourth one is to say, come buy from us. Um, and then, the, you know, if you invert that, then there's another whole series which says, um, having bought from us, why should you buy from us a second time? What more could we sell you that we're not now selling you? What solutions could we provide that you are uh, unable to find or sourcing elsewhere? And how can we build a lifelong partnership? So there's a lot more to this whole discipline than digital marketing. Uh, digital marketing is the major part of it because of the uh, digital uh, area we live in. Almost everything gets done digitally, but digital marketing does not equal marketing campaigns like uh, Facebook advertising or Google AdWords or, or anything like that. That's only a tiny part of it. The purpose of marketing is to get a customer and then keep a customer and then keep the customer coming back again and finally to become a lifetime customer and finally to give 100% of the things you could supply to that customer as a part of their purchasing. That's a tough ask. That's much, much bigger than most people think marketing is but it's a very important part of that. And we talked about all sorts of issues within that definition, uh, how to look for your target market. Who are the people who are going to be buying from you? And why should they buy from you? That $64,000 question, why you? With all the infinite choice that everyone has to buy anything worldwide, on the internet, why should they buy from you? What have you got that's different or special or even just nice to have that other people don't have? 
And if you can't answer that question, you should really go and ask your customers why they buy from you. Because if you don't know, and they don't know, you're in a terrifyingly vulnerable position. Because they might just stop buying from you any day. So, I want to uh, refresh again on the areas of um, the, the choosing the target market and making sure that that target market works for you. How do you go about that? A whole lot of techniques. You look for problems in a particular environment and then you solve that problem. So let me give you a, a for instance. There, I, um, I'm, uh, as most people know, partially sighted, and there's several companies that target blind and partially sighted people and provide them with specific products, software, hardware, and aids, um, so that they can live as normal a life as possible. And this is not a new market. This is, didn't come out in the digital arena. Um, over many years, blind people have been able to buy devices that would identify money, for instance, and tell them what the difference was between a two rand and a one rand coin, or a 10 rand and a 100 rand note. They would be able to buy devices which they could uh clip over the edge of a cup or a glass and pour until it went bing, which meant it was full. And many other similar aids. Over years and sometimes centuries were available in that market. Now, it's a little narrow niche, but there's a surprising number of companies selling surprisingly expensive equipment into that little narrow niche. Um, there are other highly specialized companies that have focused on a particular area of the market and said that we will do better than everybody else and then gone out and done just that. So there is the premier cycle for cyclists. There is the premier um, track car for motor racing enthusiasts. There's the premier cart for karting enthusiasts. There's the right running shoe. There's the all of those kind of things. So people have honed in on markets. They've identified what the problem was in that market. And then they've addressed that problem. And that's why people buy from them. Too many of our entrepreneurs, they, their business was set up years ago to manufacture something that they were good at. To do something they were good at. So they might be shop fitters or they might be general engineers or they might be boilerplate uh, boiler makers who made uh, some kind of uh, facility years ago that facility may not even exist anymore and now they become generalists in that field nothing wrong with that if you make money because then the reason that people will buy from you is generally your reputation in the field if you want to go in with a new business, though, and expect that people will buy from you simply because you're good at your trade, you might have uh, a lot of sleepless nights ahead. Because people will buy on repute or by word of mouth or by previous buying experience. But they will treat a new person in the industry with a little bit of circumspection until such time as they've established their credentials in the industry. So select your market carefully. If you are in a generalist position, maybe you sell, I don't know, some sort of fast food, you sell sandwiches. You have to ask yourself the question, why would they buy sandwiches from me versus sandwiches from someone else? And why would they buy my sandwiches rather than somebody else's hamburgers or fish and chips or pizzas or whatever? Look at carefully at your target market. If you get that right and you solve issues within your target market, you're a long, long way down the line to making very successful um, 
marketing decisions. Repeat again, marketing is not advertising. And then there's communication with that marketplace once you've identified it. So you've got to communicate with that market, and there are a couple of types of communication. There's static communication, like a brochure. So you can print a brochure, and that tells all about the wonderful things that you do, and that gets distributed to anyone who is interested. Maybe it's available electronically, and often websites are nothing more than electronic brochures. So you have static information about your organization, which can go, it's a, I speak to you, you don't have a response type communication. Outbound, static, rarely changing, gets very boring to most people. Very few people I know ever read a whole brochure or a whole website. Um, it, that would be very unusual. So most of that which you do is pretty wasted stuff. Then there is the more dynamic communication, the two-way communication. And this is most usually done either face-to-face -face or uh, on something like an exhibition or to almost the total amount on some form of social media. So you could have a LinkedIn account where you post uh, an article and invite commentary and then engage the people who comment and have a discussion on that. Uh, sites like Twitter are full of that, that kind of interaction, that two-way interaction, which many marketers find so desirable. And most SMEs don't do very well at all. They tend to do the one-way, me-tell-you kind of conversation as opposed to the two-way, um, we-talk-to-each-other conversation. And if you can get that right, and uh, whatever media you use, whether it happens to be um, a uh, series of exhibitions or road shows or something like that, where you can actually talk face-to-face one to many or one to one, um, and where you can communicate on sites like LinkedIn and Facebook and um, TikTok and all of the others, um, then you, you generally speaking will get more returns because you'll get a lot of good information coming back from the marketplace and it's all free. Some of that will be critical of what you do. Some of it will be quite hostile criticism if you're not doing things too well. And you better receive that very well because um, hostile communication probably means you're doing something not very right and you want to fix that as soon as you can. So communication, two forms, sort of static, basic, often text-based, sometimes video-based. YouTube is a good format for that. And then dynamic conversation, um, like this clubhouse talk, where anyone could ask at any time a question and we would deal with it then and there, or they could listen to a podcast and come back to us later. Communication, though, is at the heart, the heart of marketing. And that means that you've got to have a clear message that you send to people. You've got to have a clear purpose in that communication. It's not simply noise of uh, you shouting at the marketplace about how good you are. There has to be a purpose uh, to that communication, and you better get your messages fairly clearly identified before you start. Um, because if you don't get your messages right, you're going to have a, a mix of, of uh, messages, sometimes conflicting, going out from various parts of your organization, especially if you're a bit dispersed. Now, I saw a model a little while ago, and if anyone is uh, a bit vintage around here, they will remember the four Ps of marketing, product, price, promotion, 
and place, which is effectively distribution channel. And that was drummed into marketers. It was created around the 1950s, and uh, that was marketing for probably 50 years. That was all that marketing was all about. And it is still, there's still many lessons to learn in there. For instance, prices are part of marketing. And we pay such scant attention to price because it's not sexy like the marketing promotions, like advertising, like even channel management. Those are the ones which are attractive where you can see things happening. Price is kind of a bit dull and often left to the the financial people to determine. That is a huge mistake. Price is one of the most powerful marketing tools that you have, and it is a very undervalued one. So that old model has been many times revised and many times has been changed. But some years ago, uh, the company Motorola changed that model to an acronym called SAVE. So they changed the thinking around and said, we don't want to focus on products. We want to focus on solutions. So SAVE started off with solutions. And then we don't want to concentrate on place, our channels and our channel management. We wanted to focus on access, ability to get to our products in the most convenient way for our customers. Because that's what access is all about. And whether that be electronic or physical or retail or uh, wholesale or by one-on-one -on -one salespeople, whatever was the most convenient way of accessing the product should be where we, for the consumer, should be where we placed our focus, not on how we manage our channels. That's a consequence of providing convenient access, like products or a byproduct of providing working solutions to our customers. And then price became value because that's really what price is. It's a measure of value. How can we provide our solutions at an accessible place to our customers in with a tag on it which says, this is value for the stuff I have in my bank? Now remember, every time a sales happens, Someone takes some money out of their bank account and puts it into your bank account every time. So whenever you sell something, someone takes money out of their account and gives it to you. And if they're a very large customer, they take lots of money out of their bank account and give it to you. If they're a very frequent customer, they take money out of their bank account and put it in your account all day long. Now, why would anyone do a dumb thing like that? Take money out of their account and put it in your account. <laughs> and if you look at the, ba uh, the basis behind that, there is only one possible reason why they would do that. The thing that you're giving them, a product or service, is worth more to them at that time than the money they have in their bank. Now, that doesn't make sense, does it? If they find that the money in their bank is worth less than the item that you're buying, then they will give you the money. If they find the thing that you're buying is, worth, is not worth the money in their bank account, they're going to keep the money in their bank account. They're not going to buy from you.
So when you think of selling something, just think of this equation. This guy's going to take money out of his bank and put it in mine. And the only reason he would do this is that at that time, that money in his bank is worth less than what I'm selling it. Now that's value instead of pricing. And there's a world of difference between the two. That is providing value to your customers which are worth the money in their bank. Now, we could spend an entire session in a, one of these stages, maybe we will, on how pricing is very important to you and what the various methods of pricing are to do. But right now, I want to handle you know, th this acronym SAVE. The last one is the favorite of all marketeers, promotions. Promotions including advertising and all the other sexy things. And they changed that to education. Because today we have an overload of information. And what no customer wants is a whole wadge of new information coming to them which may be irrelevant. So the function of promotion becomes to educate the buyer or potential buyer on the merits and values of what you have compared to their problems and their, for, their budgets in their organization. Now that puts a whole different spin on it. It is no longer a hard sell thing. It's an information sharing exercise. And it cannot be done if it's a push type no, uh, communication. If it's me telling you. You can't educate people that way because you don't know what they don't know. So you can't provide education. You have to know where the education gaps lie and then provide that education. So S-A-V-E, solution, access, value, education. A whole new way of thinking. And it proved highly, highly successful for its founders. Great model. And if we just focus a little more on education for the last few minutes here, the whole field of education is finding out gaps in the person's knowledge. If you have a look at the statistics right now, most buyers, and it doesn't matter whether it's capital or retail goods, make do most of the buying cycle before they actually get to talk to a supplier. So it depends on the industry, but there's an average of around 60% of the time before the potential buyer buys, they will find information, usually on the internet, about the solutions that are available to their problem. And only then will they talk to potential suppliers. Now, that information that they source from the internet may be right and it may be wrong. And the job of the supplying company may well be to educate that buyer on where there are errors in his or her research. It may also be the job of the supplying company's company to educate the buyer on where they haven't yet researched and should have. So there's a whole function around that. We'll talk a little more next week on this same topic, but I think I've just about run out of time right now, Jacques. Oh, yeah, this, this is quite good. I mean, <laughs> for us oldies, and this is where I put myself in, you know, the four Ps is literally what I've sort of internalized, sunk my teeth into, and then to, to see how the four Ps is actually refreshed into... Uh, this acronym of save. I mean, it doesn't 
I don't think it, it, it extinguishes the four Ps, but what it does is it refines it. And, um, I, 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 and in particular, as you were going through um, the, the, the two, I think everything there is significant. Um, so what, what drives it for me, you know, the solution part, am I offering a solution, which means I need to understand the nature of the problem, you know, the potential markets problem, the potential buyers problem, because everything that I offer must then solve that problem. We've been talking about solutions scantily, but I think when, when you follow this acronym and you spend time on, uh, actually or, or that you place the emphasis on, on finding solutions uh for your target market then it's not merely going to come up with a product and then trying to sell that product and convince the buyer to buy it but rather understanding the problem first of all i think gives you the right to call then what you offer a solution because you've accurately defined what is required by your potential uh buyer um and in that case and and then um ending off with with i mean the stuff in between brilliant but ending off with the education in terms of just how you summarize it i think th there's a wonderful thing is the education part the preamble to that is to tell the market that you understand that you know what their problems are that you clearly understand and that you know that what you're offering will solve it for them and then, you know, so I like this acronym uh, very much, Ed. And I can already see how this, you know, just keep the framework in, in, in my head to think through the things that I'm doing in my business as well. So well done, Ed. Wonderful. Yeah, it's great, Chuck. I hope people can learn from this and the whole objective of this whole series to build better businesses, to know where you're not doing things right and fix it absolutely and i think this is so practical um that you can run it through and and, and so on so well to those uh, present and to those listening to this podcast well as usual it's only valuable if you try to take the next practical step and implement something rather than contact us and tell us oh this does not work at all but that in itself is positive and constructive so um well until next week then and uh, as you navigate through the challenges of um load shedding and all the knock-on effects of it change the way you think about how you do business just think of all of the opportunities that load shedding is providing to people <laughs> exactly. And who would you say is the load shedding specialist who's making lots of money out of load shedding? Interesting question because I can't yeah. think of anyone right now. I can think <laughs> of a lot of people getting very frustrated, but I can't think of people who've seized this opportunity and dived in there and fixed it. <laughs> yeah. Good question. It's right in front of us, and we don't see it. Eh? That's right, Ed. And what is our theme? See the opportunity in devastation. In devastation. <laughs> and here we are. Well, there's a thought for bright entrepreneurs in the coming week. Let's see who yeah. takes up the challenge. Excellent, Ed. Thank you, and okay. bye for now. See you next see week. See you next week. Bye.